Fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Well, welcome everyone and welcome to Grow at Home Artist Talks, a series where we <clears throat> hear from artists and authors about their work and practice. Grow at Home was made possible by the Arts Council England Culture Recovery Fund, which we're very grateful for. We will be live streaming recording. This will be archived on our website. We also sometimes use screen grabs um, for publicity purposes. So please be aware that if you are not comfortable being recorded, you need to switch off your webcam. There will be a question and answer section at the end of the talk. Um, please put any questions and comments you have in the chat um, as the talk goes on, and they'll be fielded to the artist by me at the end. So without further, Rosemary Clooney was born in Scotland, lives in London, and is now working from Grow Studios in Hackney Wick. She has exhibited widely since 1991 in places like the World Economic Forum in Davos and Cumberland Lodge in Windsor Great Park. Her paintings are held in eminent private and public collections. Her last major exhibition at ROSL in Mayfair was a collaboration with Booker Prize winning author Ben Ockrey, arising, in, out, arising out of their innovative book, The Magic Lamp, published by Head of Zeus. Will Gompertz of the BBC said of The Magic Lamp, this is a magical book in every sense, a spellbinding, poetic, artistic journey into our collective imagination and inner selves. The Financial Times have stated that her work recalls the, that of Juan Miro or Quentin Blake, while the New Statesman wrote, Clooney's use of colour is billowing, rich and dreamlike. Rosemary Clooney's paintings encourage the viewer to travel from the mundane world into a realm of the imagination, to an inner di dimension where art lives freely away from the climate of the present day yet it stimulates a fresh, fresh interaction with reality. Rosemary, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, friends, um, for listening in. Um, and for those who are not yet friends, thank you as well. And thank you, Pete. And thank you for Grow for inviting me to for this challenging um, talk about my artistic journey. Um, 30 years um, of painting. I think I really didn't know what I was letting myself in for um, when I started. Um, having to work in the dark in a way. It's like both um, walking a precipice um, and bathing in a warm um, motherly sea, I think, the practice of the visual arts. Walking a precipice because you're working in the dark and trying to extract something new um, day by day, year after year. Um, and yet you're bathing in a wonderful sea of the creative unconscious um, that we all share. And maybe sometimes people like me are fortunate to be able to dive into that wonderful sea every day. Um, this is um, a painting, I started off um, rather unconventionally because I have an economics degree and a sociology degree. I hadn't planned on being an artist, um, but in 1990, I decided to take my art seriously. I'd always um, drawn and painted, um, but I decided that I would become a painter, um, come what may. Um, and I started off, I taught myself, I went to master classes at the Slade uh, Summer School. I did many, many life drawing classes. And I did, a, I, I started off being quite a conventional artist. As you can see, um, the last two um, relate to um, the Hampstead Heath where I walk every day. Um, this relates to my feeling for trees. Um, it's a, an oil painting dating from nearly 30 years ago. 
And I feel that actually um, it's the spirit of the forest dancing. Um, and I think that it's very relevant in these times when we're cutting so many trees down in the Amazon. Um, this is an etching. I also did printmaking classes. Um, I also did a lot of drawing, uh, and uh, this is a uh, drawing in ink um, in Little Venice. People might think that art is a luxury um, in these times when there are so many social and economic problems. I think actually that, I mean, there are many, many problems, very serious problems. Um, the planet, um, injustice, uh, poverty. But I think that art enables, is one way to enable us to ask um, fundamental questions about humanity um, and our relationship to the planet and to each other. And so I think that it cannot be dismissed as a luxury. We really need it, um, all, all the arts and culture. Um, this is uh, an etching that was done many years ago, again, in the 90s. Um, my parents had a house in the Dordogne and um, this was resulted from a drawing um, from a very early morning walk where it was really, really misty. And this, the shape of this wonderful cow um, in the foreground and everything receding into almost this wonderful um, whiteness in the background really took my fancy. Um, and it's almost Japanese, I think, in its um, influence. Um, I also did a lot of life drawing classes and, um, and drew and painted both women and men. Um, this actually is at the moment being um, shown in, um, where is it? In Hackneywick Underground Gallery, along with some of my digital prints. I've resurrected it from um, a very, very long time ago. I, I did teach myself actually as a teenager to draw um, from Leonardo da Vinci's drawings, um, which my father had a book of. And I think it um, was a very good instruction. So even though I didn't actually go to art school for three years, I did actually find a lot of ways from doing, drawing from nature to um, gradually get the human form. But in the 90s, I taught, I, I taught myself and going to the Slade um, summer schools to paint in oils. And I, this is a series of, called Hunger for the Light. Um, and it derived from a feeling I had that not only do we have a great spiritual hunger in this world, but we also have a hunger for knowledge, for, for, for uh, the ideal, um, for beauty, um, for a more complete, kind of living um, and I felt that this and this other, the next one, which is also um, from the Hunger for the Light series. Um, you know, I also think that I was feeling something about desire and ambition and the relationships between people 
the differences between people. Some who climb high and who leap off into the unknown. All of my paintings really, really embody stories I've come to realize. Um, in fact, everything is story when you really get down to it. Um, you could say that um, the Big Bang was the first story or the word, however the, the universe um, started, um, either by the word of God or by the Big Bang or both, um, that was the first story. And in a way, everything since has been story. And in art, um, you could say that there's a story in terms of the characters in, in a painting, but you could also say there's a story between form and color and mood and shape. Um, and I think that informs my work a great deal. Um, I did a series of paintings called, still oil paintings called Floating Cities. Um, which in these days of, um, of rising oceans um, could be very prescient. Um, I also, this is a very strange one, which I'm still, I feel that things are breaking out from under our feet um, in spite of our ability or our, our feeling for trying to keep them underneath. Um, this dates, I wonder if you can see, D Pete, um, I'm seeing um, everything is covering up my the painting on the side. Um, is everybody seeing it that way? Um, I don't know, David might be able to sort that eh? out. David might be able to sort that out if there's a problem. Um, I'm seeing the picture. You, are you seeing the whole picture? Um, or just is it um, that the, the, the screens are sort of hiding the side of it? Well, only this one. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, if I'd known about that, I'd have put them more in the centre. Um, okay. Um, it's a shame because um, it's hiding, <laughs> he's hiding off of it. Um, I'll move on now. Um, Salome's Dream, another oil painting. Um, the Rising Fall. I went back to actually after 10 years of oil paintings, um, which became more and more complex, and I got involved more in the technique of painting with oil. I suddenly overnight um, stopped painting in oils and started painting uh, on paper. I went back to very, very simple lines, um, drawing, um, sometimes in black and white. This is called the rising fall. Um, it shows a being who is both rising and falling and maybe has the choice. Maybe this is our freedom whether we rise or fall. Um, and this is also called the rising, which is um, acrylic uh, on paper, which has a feeling of how interrelated we are. A nocturnal convention. Again, I think I have a feeling for the suffering of so many people. Um, I was restricting myself at this stage to black and white. Um, and then I had a phase where all I could do was portraits. 
And you may say, um, wow, this doesn't really look like anybody that I've ever seen. And in a way, um, I, I was painting the portraits of imaginary people, of people that I felt I'd either known or could know, or I don't know, they just came to me. I just, um, suffering people, comic people, um, angry people. And I used a variety of techniques. This is silk collage. Um, the silk was painted and then collaged and then painted on top. Um, and I felt that I was actually painting the inside um, of people, um, their emotions, their sufferings, their um, anxieties, their joys sometimes. I felt that I was more interested in what was inside people when I was painting their portraits. Um, the noble dreamers. and the relationship between two people. What doesn't kill us? Yeah. This one, um, actually, I think is quite comic in some ways, even though it's a bit bleak. <laughs> um, it always makes me smile. Coming through a family portrait. This again is silk collage. Um, exultate. A more, a more uplifting painting. And to come to the magic lamp, I thought I'd, um, both read from the magic lamp because um, as Pete said in his introduction, um, the writer Ben O'Cree and I collaborated on this book which came out um, three and a half years ago. Um, the paintings came first and the, 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 the stories that Ben wrote are not Neither, neither of them are illustrations. They're like parallel visions. Um, and his stories are really beautiful. Um, I will share some of the images. This is called City of Enigmas. Um, and Ben's story of this is really amazing. Um, a mystic betrothal. The stoic season. Actually, let me read something out first of all about um, about the magic lamp. The images in the magic lamp were mostly painted 15 years ago. Um, all the paintings share the premise that we are an integral part of our landscape. The convention in painting has been to separate the two, but I believe things are interconnected, are linked and interact with one another. I'm gonna read a little story from the age of um, L'Epoque Magique. 
which is goes with this. Without knowing it, we have crossed a magic line in time. We had been in the dark age of iron. It seemed to last forever. Then one night the stars were brighter. A blue and orange fragrance floated in the air. It had a hint of saffron. Children in the poor district saw at dawn blinding flashes of a yellow angel's wings. That morning we felt a tingling sensation in our feet. A mermaid with a piercing voice was singing in the far reaches of the Thames. A beggar was seen levitating at dusk on the outskirts of the city. From the graveyard, the skull of a dead poet was reciting forgotten Tertzarimas in reverse. An alchemist on a barge turned a dead pigeon into gold with a black powder. His incantations were impressive. But in the street one afternoon, the simple miracle took place. A woman laced in blues and reds sprouted dark, beautiful wings under the astonished gaze of a gypsy child. The age of iron is over. The age of magic has begun. Unveil your eyes. That's the book. The Blue Crusade, one from my portrait. I always felt this lady was um, from the age of the Crusaders. I don't know why these portraits came to me. Those enchanted songs. A French flavor. And were we from an angel fall? These are paintings now that um, came afterwards. I um, was very influenced by um, the ancient world and archeology. span and very influenced by what, by the symbolic world that, that lies underneath our consciousness, the world of myths. And in a way that the very top part is like our consciousness. And these are some of the, um, the forces um, and forgotten powers. Um, that are lying underneath the surface um, in our minds, um, maybe part of our history, collective unconscious. Um, again, um, this is like an ancient stellae with... Um, I've been very influenced by hieroglyphics and um, different alphabets. Um, Paul Clay was very, also very influenced by those. Dialogue of death with the afterlife. Um, this has a very strong ancient Egyptian influence. I think the... Um, the figure on the left is a bar, which is um, a part of the spirit of a human after death. Um, but actually quite hopeful, I think, in spite of it being involving death. I think it's a hopeful interaction with death. I had a long phase as well, a series of paintings um, that were very influenced by 
the first painters, the first cave painters. And again, um, there was um, a put, there was a competition actually that was organized by a gallery um, on a painting that could be influenced by a poem. And I was influenced um, by um, four lines from a poem, um, again, by Ben Okri in Wild. Um, and it was about, um, about a stone that was found two million years ago, shaped by our ancestors, two million years ago, a quartz um, tool. And the first four lines go fire in the river dream and fear in the valley, night and the stone and hunger in the sky. And for some reasons I was, I was haunted for this period um, by those very, very, very ancient ancestors of ours. Um, and their relationship to the landscape, which, which was a much closer one than we have, a much more harmonious one than we have with um, our natural world. And um, having seen um, the British, British Museum exhibition um, on their art, I realized that actually they were not they are not primitive um, aesthetically. They actually produced some very, very highly sophisticated um, artworks. And um, it led me to believe that actually they, their inner life was probably more sophisticated than we, than we imagine. And I did a series of paintings. Um, this is called, called War Calls in the Distance. Um, and again, I did, I did a lot of um, these paintings, um, Maybe I should talk about my technique. Um, my technique is not deliberate. Um, I tend to allow textures and patterns to form and then a story sometimes very abstract, like in this case, although there is a story here. Um, but <laughs> this is a flower. There's a tiny little figure there in the distance between the hills. This is kind of like a harvest moon. And again, shows how strong the landscape is, how we should respect it. Um, this again is um, landscape as landscape integrated with the human. And I did a series, these are more recent paintings. I did a series of, like the very first painting I showed you where the, the forest itself in a way was dancing. I feel in a way that the, this is the movement of the inner spirit of the woods. Um, the ancient energies, maybe calling out to us to do something. So 
some of these paintings I don't think I could really discuss. Um, I think they speak for themselves. I think in many ways, paintings need to be really looked at for a long time. And I found out that people's responses to my paintings are very varied. Um, and in a way, a painting is interacting with each person, with what they bring, um, with their inner world. And each person is bringing something different, memories, um, thoughts, ideals. And so I've had some people say that a painting really scared them and other people saying that it really inspired them, the same painting. Um, this was done just a few years ago. Besides um, the ancient cave painters um, and ancient Egypt, the, the hieroglyphics, the murals, I've also been influenced by the paintings on Greek ancient Greek vases, Japanese prints. Um, I've also been influenced by clay, Paul Clay, obviously, um, Miro. Um, Gustave Moreau. And this is a painting about relationships. Again, stories that in a way, the, the, the stories in paintings are ones that actually are not ones that can really be put into words. They have to be felt, I think. Um, otherwise, one would tell a story. You know, this is a story about togetherness and conflict, in a way, love and conflict um, and many more things. Again, this is another, this is a more recent painting. It's a very large painting. Um, and this was done actually during lockdown. And I think it reflected both um, the pain of separation of people um, and I think many, many people who were, I was on my own um, and I did a lot of work, but I think many people had to resolve issues um, being together so much. Um, a few paintings of landscapes and also, um, I did a whole series of collages with um, during lockdown with card, um, playing around with color, texture, uh, well, not so much texture, but line um, and form and relationships. Because in a way, art is also about the relationships between things. For some reason, this always makes me smile. I 
I think actually then um, these are just a few digital um, works, prints. I think Pete, actually I'm finished. Fantastic. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, can't even see myself. I can't hear you. You can. Okay. Good, brilliant. Um, I've got, uh, that was amazing. Thank you very, very much. Um, I've got quite a few, I'm gonna just read out quite a few of these comments. Um, let me just uh, make this visible for me. Okay. Um, ben Ockery says to everyone, these are magic images, so lovely, lovely to see them in this way. Um, Vanessa, my French is not very good. Vanessa Gijani, uh, so true, they're beautiful. Uh, Laura Fiori, uh, to everyone, um, how do you do the emojis? There's lots of hearts and that in, in various colors. <laughs> um, me, don't be shy, ask any questions. Laura Fiori. Um, okay, which which painter were you inspired by? I mean, you've told us a couple. Um, run us through your influences again. Pardon, who, me? Yeah, who are you influenced by? Who are you inspired by? Um, what, you mean painters or, or life or what? Which painter were you inspired by? Um... Well, I, I, as I said, I was inspired by um, um, Paul Clay, uh, Max Ernst, um, um, Miro, uh, Gustave Moreau, um, many, many painters, many, um, not to mention, um, as I said, Japanese, um, Japanese printmakers, um, of the 17th and 18th century, as well as um, everybody, really. But those were, and African masks. Do you like Mar Chagall? Chagall, yes, of course, yeah. I, I see like, um, and, and folk art, I mean, I, I, I see that Chagall was quite, he was quite into folk art, wasn't he? He kind of, um, and I wondered if you like folk art as well. You talked about cave paintings, but I, I kind of, I see sort of a folk sort of art influence in it as well. Well, um, in a way, because I actually tried, I was actually very influenced by Ben Oakley's work. Um, he was uh, in The Famished Road, which won the Booker Prize. Um, he was trying to actually expand the Western uh, view of, let's say, um, what we call reality into a much more multidimensional reality um, to, to include the world of spirits, uh, the unborn, um, a, a much wider um, world. And I was actually trying to do that um, a bit more in, uh, in, on the paper, on the canvas. Now, to do, um, to do that, you have to simplify. You can't actually do uh, um, shadows and, you know, um, you can't be what you, you can't actually um, do classical uh, Renaissance art if you're trying to expand the dimensions. So in a way you have to simplify. And that's why many of the paintings seem very simple um, when you're saying folk art. Uh, in a way it's because I had to pare things down almost to outlines so that I could actually show the interconnectedness of planes. Um, so the in a way the landscape and the figures um, are sometimes merged. Um, okay. So it's actually quite philosophically complex, um, which folk art I don't think always is. Um, well, I'm trying to actually do something quite um, difficult. Okay. I mean, this one, for example, is almost like um, a city merging with uh, its inhabitants um, and nature um, and the spirit of something underneath. Um, so it's actually quite complex. Okay. Um, I've got a couple more. Um, 
Jordana says, uh, Jordana Greaves from Grow says, your work always blows me away. At the same time, it calms and soothes me. Uh, I can hear birds tweeting in the background, a perfect compliment to your paintings. Um, Simon Cole, uh, in reference to the picture, I think which was before the one called Stoic, where you couldn't see the whole of the picture. He says, nobody sees the whole of the picture and there's a emoji. And after that, he's also asked, could you talk about the painting Stoic? Sorry, the I'm Stoic not really season. At... Stoic, yeah. Well, actually, there, there is a really, really beautiful poem that goes with this um, by Ben. But um, these paintings were done like 15 years ago, a lot of them. I mean, um, the ones in the book were done a very long time ago. This painting, in a way, um, is very pared down. These people, the lines of communication and interconnection between them um, are shown. Um, there's also something very archetypal. Um, yep. Yeah, um, I'm more interested in essence, you know, in, in, in the kind of inner essence of something than actually superficial particularities. Uh, you know, like I'm not interested in like racial types because I think we're uh, or male, female types that in a way we are actually, I'm more interested in the, the inner universal person that transcends that. Okay. Ben uh, Okri again says, um, geez, where do you get your feeling for colours from? It's intuitive, moody, mysterious. How do you do it? How do you get those haunting hues? Um, apart from being a very good compliment, um, it's also quite a technical question. Come on, what, what, what kind of paint do you use? <laughs> how, do you get it to, how, get, how do you get it to do that? And they are beautiful and haunting. Um... Well, it, it, it has come from experimenting over many, many years. It's also an intuitive um, um, feeling for color. Um, but I started off by, um, in a way, like, like Paul Clay did, um, Clay actually experimented with just like two colors um, together. And I paired things down to only using like two or three colors um, for a while and saw what saw in a way what worked um but i think that you, that um colors have a very strong effect on people um and we need color we need color a great deal and um like a very very strong red i don't actually use a lot of red anymore i used to when i started out my my um feeling for color has grown and, and, and changed over the last 30 years. Um, I use red very sparingly. I mean, in a way, this um, here, these buildings are on fire, maybe in the background, and that's why there's some red. Um, but um, I, for example, this, I also use a lot of black. So I have a lot of very strong black paintings. Um, this is just a very, very small selection of my paintings because I have um, some very, very strong ones that maybe are too strong for this talk. And, um, and gardens, you know, much gentler ones. Um, this is in a way, this is called City of Enigmas. And in a way it's, um, it's like the embodiment of a city. Um, personified. Um, are, are you in um, uh, Italo, Italo Calvino, Invisible Cities? Is that a, was that an Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I've got yeah. a few more. Let's uh, talking of Italo, Italo Calvino. We've got um, an Italian, I think I'm guessing this is Italian. Lara Fiore says, Dear Rosemary, greetings from Italy. Yeah, hello, Lara. <laughs> um, Rosemary Gray, uh, simply love hunger for the light, Rosemary. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you, um, Rosemary. 
Canna Grey, the colours are so incredibly vibrant. And uh, again, uh, uh, people are mentioning light. Uh, D Marie Dane Kukuti, the way light bursts in every theme of Rosemary's paintings, even the dark one, is unique. Um, oh, thank people, you. Thank people, you, Marie um, Dane. Yeah, Marie Dane is, um, is a giving... great archaeologist. Ah, oh, great. Uh, people are giving a thumbs up to Mark Chagall and love hearts and praying hands to Paul Clay and your colours are magic says Lara um, Michael Boyd wonderful thank you when did you start painting uh, uh, Lara Fiori says um, I think you mentioned that maybe they missed that yeah no I, I painted always I mean from a child um, I in when I was a teenager, because I never really had formal art lessons, because um, I did Latin and um, languages um, and science. Um, but uh, because I always painted and drew as you know, uh, in my spare time, uh, and I copied actually not just uh, Leonardo's drawings, but also William Blake um, and other people. Um, and even at university, when I was doing sociology and economics, I still painted. Um, so it wasn't until, you know, I was, I was no longer um, um, in my 20s when I actually decided to take it seriously. And um, I'm very grateful. Do you think your sociology <laughs> background has influenced your, your work? I mean, you talk about people, togetherness, and um, uh, not seeing a definition of different, um, you know, tribes or heritage or race or whatever you want to call it. Um, is, that, is that something that you've studied in sociology or? Well, well, or maybe, um, uh, I think maybe, yeah. I mean, I studied Marx, um, Durkheim. Um, I studied lots of people who talked about, but I mean, I always was an idealist and a bit of a revolutionary in the sense that um, I really believe we're in, interconnected, not just as human beings, but with the natural world, with our beautiful mother earth. And um, in a way, if I can reflect that in my paintings and spread that light to other people, um, you know, I would feel, I would feel that um, it had been worthwhile. Okay. Um, ben Ockery says, there should be a major exhibition. The world needs to see these paintings. Are you working on this? Are you working on a major exhibition or a minor exhibition or any exhibition at the moment? What's coming up? Um, I'm, working on, I'm working on some actually very major, very major works, but I'm also actually working with an exhibition uh, on a, an exhibition with Ben himself. We're doing a collaboration um a very interesting collaboration that's one exhibition that we're working on um feel, and feel i'm working on other it. things too huh? feel free to plug it <laughs> it's like the jonathan ross show you know it's like a, a loaded question isn't it and so what's happening next he's like well i brought my book with me you know or whatever so tell us about <laughs> tell us about when that's happening no, no no it's not um it's not actually um written in stone yet but the works, the works are made, um, and well, um, I'm nearly finished, um, and really incredible works. Actually, the combination of a writer. I mean, we've taken our collaboration um, with the magic lamp to completely different a new terrain um, to completely different kind of work. Um, but I'm also working on some very new, very large canvases um, 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 of my own as well. Brilliant. Um, let me see. Yeah, well, Vanessa um, says, wonderful to know about the coming exhibition. Look forward to seeing it. How, how did the collaboration originally come about with um, Ben Offrey? 
Well, he's um, a very old friend. Um, we've known each other for more than 30 years. Um, strangely enough, we had done a few small collaborations a very long time ago, but um, he, the magic lamp came about because um, he used to ask me to borrow some of my paintings just to have around at his flat. And very occasionally he used to write something to go with it. And uh, the, we never intended it to be a book, but somehow they accumulated over 15 years. And suddenly we thought, hmm, we could do a book. And it happened. And then we've had some exhibitions to go with the, um, the last one was in Mayfair at the ROSL. But there's also one in Abergavenny, the museum there. Um, but of course, COVID has stopped all that. Yeah, for now. Yeah. But you've been working throughout the lockdown, as you said. Yeah. Did you find it productive, a productive time to make art in? Very productive, yeah. yeah. Very, very productive. I think, I think a lot of people who are artists, who kind of an established practice or something like that, kind of breathed a sigh of relief almost and just got on with loads of work. <laughs> You can't go is that, to the, is that what you no, found? <laughs> yeah, there's no distractions. You know, I'm not spending any money on pints of beer at the pub and people sort of, you know, distracting and get down, yeah. get down and do it. For the first I time mean, in a long time that you haven't had to actually, you know. But I think in a way what, what I did find useful was having a kind of discipline of actually saying, right, I'm going to do um, two hours of this every day and two hours of that, you know, in a way to do it day after day. Um, it, it sort of made lockdown bearable. Um, I think, obviously, if you have a large family and there were a lot of people making demands on you, that would have been more difficult. Um, but I, f I found it very, very, very inspiring. Um, um, but it was a very heartbreaking period, you know, um, so many people dying and suffering and losing loved ones. Um, so it was, it was both creative and traumatic, um, you know, and I hope that, you know, we learn from it. Yeah. But, I mean, hopefully we will. <laughs> <laughs> You're you're very optimistic about the human race. I, I, um, I'm a little uh, bit more I, I, pessimistic about that. No, no, no. I'm I I am optimistic, but um, I I am also realistic. I know there's a lot of very stupid. Um, no, there's a lot of very ignorant forces out there. Let's say, um, and um, a lot of very selfish forces out there. Um, you know, you know, media and all sorts of things. Um, but I, I would like to say that uh, I was thinking this morning, because I was in Grow Studios, my Grow Studio um, this morning at um, eight o'clock in the morning. And I was thinking how fortunate I was to be part of the Grow community um, and to have that space to paint in. Well, that's our plug, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your fiver. <laughs> <laughs> well it is it's a wonderful wonderful community it is yeah, it, it is. is yeah i think people need each other especially artists don't they and or well, people of all uh, creative disciplines it's good when they're together well hopefully we can come out of all this wiser you know what, what when you just when you said you've got some that you wouldn't you didn't think they you thought they were too dark or too kind of oppressive to show or Oh, I've got I've got a lot of work. I've got some very big abstract works, um, actually based on 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 archaeology. Actually, um, very much based on on the archaeology of the inner being, um, which that I find they're very connected. Um, and I've got a lot of very very dark dark black um, and dark paintings. Um, uh, very big ones, and I've got some very 
um, for want of a better word, um, hopeful, maybe spiritual paintings, also very, very big, but they wouldn't look good on a small screen. You know, mm. you need, um, you need, you need a proper exhibition. We need to be all together, hugging each other, drinking champagne, and um, you know, having a proper exhibition. Sounds sounds pretty good. Who's buying? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we need a gallery to provide. Oh yeah, yeah, we need <laughs> we need finance. Yeah, yeah, we need a gallery to provide the the yeah. Yeah, so we all artists need a a patron, don't they, of some sort? I think. Um, Jordana says we love you as part of the grow community too, Rosemary. Oh, so very inspiring. There's another one of these, another one of these hearts, you know. <laughs> they don't translate. Um, you guys work really hard. You really do. Yeah, you know. <laughs> we do. <laughs> well, we do. We pretend we don't because it's not cool to be, you know. But we actually work really hard, yeah. These, um, that's quite a dark one, isn't it? I mean, it, it's got, a, you know, refugees, skyscrapers in the background, fence, barbed wire. That's what I get from that one. Yeah. You see, people will get different things. Um, but, yeah. You see, that's quite a small one. Well, I mean, it's um, small enough for you to actually see it well on the screen. Um and the technique behind that, it almost looks like batik or something like that, in a, in a sense. Do you, are you influenced by sort of textile things I, like that? Yeah, sort of. But um, I'm also, I also do create um, patterns, as I said, which in a way my, my works are not deliberate. I create patterns um, through various techniques. And then the story or the characters or the scene um, suggests it emerges. Um, I'm very into the suggestiveness of, of the story in a way. Um, Lisa Henderson, you see, I'm, I'm multi-platforming here. I'm on, I'm on Zoom, WhatsApp and um, um, uh, Facebook. So here we go, uh, multitasking man. <laughs> rare thing isn't it um probably cock it all up uh, lee henderson on facebook says seems like the frequency of your work reflects the, the, the way you talk beautiful vibrant and energetic on a, a face with two love hearts oh thank you yeah thank you um you know as an artist i know any based artist as well wherever it works You think we will rise from this? We have to. Look, we we've, got no, we've got no choice. You know, even if it means chucking, um, chucking the ignorant people that are leading us, you know. I mean, that's, we that's, have the, to. Marks, that's the marks bit, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it, it's beyond marks. It's almost like the planet, you know. Because Marx, in a way, did not have a spiritual element. He was very into matter, just matter, you know. Um, he was, the, he was the, the, wasn't he the, the offspring of, he was the uh, three, three, at least three generations of rabbis, I think, behind him. And he, yeah, but I mean, if, you, if you've read any of his work, he doesn't bring any spiritual element no, he rejected at it. all. He rejected, huh? it. he rejected it, surely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think that in a way, the, the true revolution is one where we go back to where our ancestors were in harmony with the planet and with each other, you know? Um, and that is the real revolution. And yeah. actually there, there are a lot of um, small movements around the, uh, around the planet, um, you know, bringing that about. That's good. I've got a couple of questions in the chat here. Um, oh, Nicholas McLean. Thank you very much, Rosemary and Ben. I look forward to the next exhibition. Yeah, so, so do we. Um, 
if, if anyone's Thank got you. any more... <laughs> Thank if anyone's, you. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. Just say something. Thank you. Is this quite an early one, Salome? Um, this is an oil painting, yeah. yeah. So this is from the 90s. Um, yeah. 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 It's interesting that the king figure is actually quite small compared to the others. Yeah. Well, he was at, he was kind of being manipulated, wasn't he? He was. Yeah. He wasn't the one. It wasn't the one with the power. That was the dancer, surely. Um, or her mum. Um, <laughs> according to the legend, they always blame the women, don't they? Um, no, 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 no. We don't want to blame the women. No, we don't. Um, okay. I mean, if, if everyone's got any more questions, fire them off now, because I think um, at a point of talking about um, Salome, power, revolution, and the power of these pictures and the power of, that they inspire to, for us to, our spirits to rise up within us when we look at them anyway, I'd say, um, if, if not the world, we can't influence that from this but. I think they're absolutely brilliant and I've thoroughly enjoyed looking at them and your comments in, in the chat um, and your collaboration, your collaborator, Ben, has, has also articulated it far better than I, I did. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rose. Thank you, Pete. Thank you very much for um, comparing it so brilliantly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good Thank night. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you.